The criminal department at MLFA handles national security cases. Those cases are primarily involve uh, uh, alleged acts of terrorism or criminal investigations that involve the terrorism task force at the federal level. Those are 2339A, 2339B, 2339C. Those are all statutes that make it illegal to provide resources to foreign terrorist organizations or entities. Uh, we primarily handle those cases uh, in our criminal defense. We also have handled other things that relate to it. These are crimes that are considered related to terrorism. Uh, now, let me be very clear. What we don't handle are terrorists. We don't handle people who have actually blown something up or actually tried to hurt someone. What we handle are people who are accused of being associated with them, accused of providing money to a nonprofit that they think, gee, they're doing good there. And the government argues, no, that's terrorism. Uh, or situations where the government came in and created the entire scenario wherein the person might provide support in some way to do it. Those are the type of cases that we handle. Right, so how is MLFA different from other Muslim nonprofit and legal advocacy organizations? Uh, in the criminal department, we're different because we're the only ones that do it. No other organization provides representation in the criminal sphere. Uh, we are the only ones that do this, and we're fairly unique in the entire country. Only inside nonprofit organizations in death penalty cases do you see a nonprofit that does criminal representation. However, it's at the heart of what we do. And it's important because the Muslim community is uniquely terrorized and uniquely impacted uh, by the FBI's counterterrorism program. They're spending $3 billion investigating and prosecuting the American Muslim community. And we're out because that money is wasted. It's a law-abiding community. We're fighting the abuses that occur in those investigations. With that much money and that much resources dedicated to it, the government is going to engage in abusive practices and has for 20 years. Yeah. How is the MLFA model different from other criminal defense organizations like the federal public defender and private defense firms? We're different because we specialize. This is all we do. All of those other organizations represent a myriad of criminal defendants, anything from drug dealing to murder to uh, sexual assaults. All of these sort of things fall within money laundering. All of this falls within uh, their representation. They don't specialize. They're generalists. Even when they specialize in federal criminal defense, they're still generalists. We specialize, and that allows us to build expertise. And uh, specialization is necessary here. And the reason for that is simple. The government specializes. At DOJ, they have a specialized unit in Washington, D.C. that just does these prosecutions. They augment any U.S. attorney's office when they are prosecuting a national security case. They have ex The government has experts. What we do is counter those experts to make sure that the American Muslims' interests are being protected. Because if there's nobody fighting, they're going to win in a line slide and they'll keep pushing it. All right. Do you believe that criminal defense provides, that the criminal defense uh, MLFA provides makes a difference in the Muslim community? I do. First thing is I've seen firsthand what a criminal prosecution of an American Muslim does to the community that it happens in. It often gets headline news. It's, you know, a rather minor crime quite often. Nothing happened, nobody got hurt, nothing, no money was stolen, it's minor. But the impact on the American Muslim community is huge. The thousands of Muslim prosecutions over the last 20 years has instilled in the American public the idea that Muslims are dangerous. If there's no defense, there's no counter narrative. And without that counter narrative, the Muslim community will always be viewed as dangerous. All right, Charlie, describe a moment in a case that encapsulated our mission. It's a recent case. We've had uh, tremendous successes, but there was a recent case in Nashville, Tennessee. 
in that case, we were representing a young uh, female Muslim revert. And at the beginning of the case, you could tell from the judge he was a hostile to us. And he was also hostile to the defendant. He believed that clearly, based on the representations of the government, that national security was at risk. Over three years of litigation, we changed his mind. We educated him uh, so that at the end of it, he pointed out how well represented she'd been, how overblown the charges were, how overblown the conduct was. What we did was educate that judge. Now, that judge had a huge impact because he's also the chief judge for that district. And that education filters out to their bench, and they are not going to view the next national security in the middle district of Tennessee the same way. And that's huge for us, because what we want to do is educate the judiciary that there's another side told. And if no one's telling that story, the, the judiciary is going to continue to believe the government. And that's what's happened for 20 years. And that's why I think we impact that moment. I've educated a judge. He's a judge who has substantial voice. And now he gets it. That's a huge win. Yeah. All right, Charlie, can donors face repercussions for donating to MLFA? No, this, this simple part on it is, what we do is protected by the Sixth Amendment of the Constitution, which guarantees any individual the right to counsel. Now, the Supreme Court has interpreted the Sixth Amendment, and in unanimous decisions, they found a couple of things. First, that uh, interference with the Sixth Amendment rights uh, voids a prosecution. It can void the case entirely. That if the government engages in interference, they've also found importantly that the funds that hire attorneys to do the defense, if you interfere with those, you're also interfering with a criminal defense. So if the government takes any action against one of our donors in any way, shape, or form, they're interfering in a person's Sixth Amendment rights. And therefore, the Sixth Amendment shields not only our organization, it shields the donors from any repercussions. How does somebody get, get help from MLFA's criminal department? Well, the first thing they do is they go to our website or they go to somebody at MLFA or they get referred or maybe they came from care, but it all starts with an intake process. What we do is first screen the process. They come in and they state what their need is, where they're at, no matter where they're at in the criminal prosecution. And then we take an immediate look at, hey, does this fall within our mission? In other words, does it involve the type of things that we have? We do get re requests to, hey, represent me in a rape case or in a fraud case or something like that. And normally we're not going to take those cases because they're outside of our mission. We're specialized. We do what we do because of the benefit to the community. Um, and if it meets that criteria, the next thing we're going to do is we're going to research the case to see if it's a good vehicle to advance community interests. Uh, we're also going to see, are we going to add something? Uh, you know, who's representing them? Do they need additional help? Where are they at in the process? Can we really add value? If we can't add value, then we're, again, going to go to our board of directors and tell them that. Ultimately, the decision will be made by our by the legal committee, which is composed of a group of Muslim lawyers that look at what we have to say and then makes the decision on whether we're going to represent them. But the first step in every case is to reach out to us. All right. Charlie, what do you like best about your job? gives me an opportunity to use the expertise that I've gained doing almost 20 years of national security litigation uh, on behalf of a wide variety of people, whether they were military personnel or in one case, Bin Laden's driver and other things, uh, and a cause that I truly believe in. I believe in due process. I believe due process is one of the pillars that makes America great. And I also believe that Muslims are not receiving it. And to fight for that, and to make sure that in these high profile cases that due process, 
that we, you know, that there is a right for the defendant to be heard and they are heard effectively. That's the most exciting thing I could do. That's right. What do you like least about your job? I hate saying no. Everybody who knows me knows I hate saying no. I hate having a family on the line and realizing that this would be a case I'd like to take. I'd be interested in that case, but we just don't have the resources to do it at this time. Over the years, we've made it more efficient. We take we say yes more than we have, but we have far, far more meritorious requests where we could make a difference than we can possibly take. And I hate that reality. So what's something people don't know about your job? Uh, I don't think that they really understand how much we do before we get into court. I don't think they understand how critical it is to have representation when you're in an investigation by the FBI. Inside the federal system, representation at this stage often makes the difference between being charged and not being charged. And our preference is our clients don't get charged. Because if they don't get charged, we don't get bad law. We don't get a bad result. We don't get a bad anything. We'll move on to the next one. And so we spend an awful lot of time doing this. And I don't think they understand the expertise that is necessary to convince the FBI and the Justice Department to move along. But that's at the heart of what we do. And it's something we don't get to talk about because if somebody's before a grand jury, an organization, or an individual, or they're under investigation, we can't reveal that, but it's an awful lot of what we do. Great. What are the plans for the criminal department in the future? We, over the last nine years since uh, we were founded, we have established a reputation in the national security sphere for doing the best. We've done the impossible. We've actually won a major national security case. We have, our, when it comes to sentencing, our sentences are half the average. Uh, we've established a methodology that people can look to that it's repeatable. We do it again and again and again. Uh, and so we've established a reputation among criminal practitioners that we know what we're doing. We also know that no matter how much the community funds us, no matter how much in that part, is there's a limit to what we can do. So what we want to do is build on that. We want to turn ourselves into an organization that also is a resource center, that criminal defense attorneys from around the country, when they have these cases, can tap into that uh, provides not just criminal defense in our cases, but helps other criminal defense attorneys do it better and stands to advocate for the changes that are necessary in this area of the law. Uh, so we look at the part is that first we built it, then we demonstrated that it works, and now we want to make it a resource to everyone. What more do you need to make those plans a reality? Well, yes, right now uh, we're, you know, with the staff that we've had, which is kind of like the staff we've had for the last nine years, we're up to our, our eyeballs with the cases we have. It's important that we keep taking cases. If you become academic only, then you're not going to have the reputation because in the criminal defense community, it's really what have you done lately? Okay. So we need the resources to both be a resource attorney and continue to represent clients. Because there are going to be cases where we need to represent the client or even partnering. What does that mean? Well, we need to add several attorneys. And the simple part, we need, we've learned the specialized type of investigation that needs to be done. And we need to add somebody. And what we see at the top areas in this area where let's say clients have tons of money is that there are these specialists. And we want to add to our staff because adding to our staff doesn't double the amount of cases that we can impact. It means that we can impact almost any national security case that comes down, the 30 or 40. We're not doing two or three. You know, right now we're doing, we have carrying about four cases. It doesn't mean we add eight cases. It means we're impacting all 30. And if we can do that, then we can have that same impact that DOJ is having. 